Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System. And thank you for joining us on this uh, Conditions and Outlooks webinar. This webinar is being presented today by my office, along with the Bureau of Reclamation, the State Engineer's Office, Bureau of Land Management, the National Weather Service, uh, USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub and University of Wyoming Extension and the U.S. Geological Survey. And today we'll be looking at the current drought status, uh, climate conditions, reservoir ops, water administration, uh, weather forecasts, and some outlooks, including uh, fire potential. And at the end, we'll look at some uh, briefly at some ways that you can help report on conditions in your area. So jumping off into current conditions, we have the newly released drought monitor map. Uh, like last month, I'll quickly highlight this link over here, which goes to about a oh, two and a half minute video that explains some of how the map is created. I'm sure many of you have seen it by now, but for any newcomers on here today, I might wanna give it a, a quick view at some point in time. Uh, there been quite a number of changes since our last webinar and the locations of those changes are pretty much all over the state. Uh, there's been continued improvement that was seen after the heavy rains uh, back in June up in the, the Northwest. Uh, but the benefit of those is mostly gone now. Uh, we've seen soil moisture steadily deteriorate there. Um, some continuing dryness in the West and down in the Southeast has caused some degradation there. Uh, Albany, Laramie, uh, Southern Platte and Goshen counties did see some pretty good precipitation in the last 24 hours. Uh, in fact, uh, a little after 3 a.m. here in Laramie, we were woken by some of the heaviest rain I've seen in, in several years. And I've heard from folks in Cheyenne that uh, they saw the same thing over there, probably a little bit more than, than we saw here. This is what the 14-day total precipitation looks statewide as a percentile. Uh, above the median down here in South Central, Southwest part of the state, up here in the Southern Bighorn Basin, Southern Bighorns, a little bit left over still from the, or not left over, but uh, some additional stuff up here in the North uh, West and some up here in the, the Powder Basin area in Campbell County. But on the dry side of things, we have the, the West over here, uh, Southern Teton, Northern Lincoln County Park, parts of Fremont, uh, the central part of the state here in Matrona and Converse counties looking not too good in the last 14 days. And then continuing dryness over in Goshen and Platte County, where you can see us down in the uh, oh, five to 10 percentile. So uh, could use a little bit more up in that area. This probably will change a little bit once the numbers from uh, this morning come in on top of it. But right now, not looking not looking too good over here in this area here. The same thing at 90 days, uh, we're still seeing some of the effects of that uh, June precipitation up there, the Yellowstone flooding, uh, it's still working its way into the signal. So three months down the road, that event is still showing up and making this area up here in the uh, 98th, 100th percentile. Uh, we still have a good area down here along the Uinta Sweetwater border in the Southwest. And then quite a bit of the Northern part of the state is, is on the, uh, the upper side of, of the median. Uh, not as bad at 90 days as we were seeing in the 14 day over here in the in the western part, but the southeast here, especially up here in Carbon and, and Converse County, we're we're down there in that five to ten percentile on the on the 90 day or three month look as well. This is standard precipitation evapotranspiration index, or uh, affectionately known as the SPEI. And since the SPEI is a bit more complex than a simple precip map, just a quick explanation for, for anyone who's joining us for the first time, uh, the index is calculated using precipitation and evapotranspiration data, and it gives more of a sense of the water balance compared to just looking at straight precipitation. If you have a little precip but are not losing too much of the atmosphere, that's not as bad as receiving maybe a bit more precipitation, but you're losing a lot through evaporation. And since this is an index, you'll see the numbers over here uh, range from greater than two to down below minus two. Uh, the, on the negative side, uh, the negative two means that you're on the, on the dry and on the positive side up in the two, uh, you know, anything positive is you're, you're in wetter conditions. 
And these maps show the 30 and 60 day time frames on the top and one year down here on the bottom right. And we're starting to see some, uh, quite a few concerning areas um, uh, outlined here in the 30 day. Uh, you're seeing that little bit in the central part here in uh, Converse, Natrona County showing up. Uh, a little bit of a, still a little bit of a wetness down there in the southern part, uh, kind of disappearing from the, the 60 day. Uh, 60 day is still having some of that Yellowstone flooding showing up there as a, a real deep blue. And you can see it over here in the in the southeast, uh, not as bad as we're uh, currently looking at right now in the 30 day up in here. But down here, you can see that it was worse at 60 days compared to over here at the, uh, the 30 days. So there is improvement down here, at least in Laramie County. And then down here on the, the lower right, you can see the, the one year. A lot of gray here, meaning that we're right about at the median. Uh, you can see the uh, southeast here, again, longer term, we were, we were seeing a lot of dryness there, but uh, it has improved, like I say, at least in Laramie County, and that should improve a little bit more with what we saw last night as well, last night and this morning. Uh, this is the 14 day average minimum temperature. Uh, this is on the upper right here is showing absolute temperature and down here on the lower left is showing the departure from the minimum. Uh, up here on the upper right, uh, our highest points, uh, you know, we're looking at the uh, Big Horn Basin, Fremont County and the Plains, uh, looking at lows in the uh, 60s and a little bit, you know, mid 60s, a little bit in some of these spots as a departure from normal with them pretty much above average, except for, you know, here in Natrona, going a little bit over into Converse and then a little bit up here in Northern Lincoln, part of Park uh, County, and a little bit down here in the higher elevation of the winds. Uh, looking at the same thing, but as a maximum temperature uh, above 60 degrees uh, statewide, including the, the real high elevations, maybe a little bit in here where we're dipping down below 60. Uh, 90 degrees plus out in, in much of the plains areas. And as a departure uh, north and, and east, we're looking three to six degrees above average, whereas the southwest, uh, a little bit up here into the Bighorns, uh, Fremont, uh, Washakie County, uh, up to three degrees above average. A few little minor areas down here, we went to Sweetwater and then also the Sweetwater Carbon uh, boundary area where we're actually a little bit below the, the average, uh, as much as three degrees below the average. And this shows uh, where we've been with the soil moisture. This is a comparison of the last two weeks. Uh, conditions in the south, especially south central, are improving somewhat, but we're steadily losing ground north, uh, central, east central parts of Wyoming. Uh, you can see on the left that even two weeks ago, we lost a lot of the benefit of those rains that were up in June, where uh, if you remember during the last webinar, we were showing the, the current uh, soil moisture percentile was up around the 90th percentile. So we've lost a lot of ground with, uh, once, the, once the precip turned off up there. And this just shows soil moisture at a specific point. This is uh, our mesonet station on the, the uh, Campbell Converse border in the uh, Thunder Basin grasslands. See a nice kick up here in the soil moisture at about 10 through 30 centimeters, uh, thanks to a rain event that brought about 42 hundredths of an inch at the station. And there's actually a little bit more that fell north of there. And unfortunately, you can see that that downward trend uh, you know, it's only a, a few days there where we get the benefit of that. And then by about a week or so later, we're just a little bit above where we were and, and then continuing to decline at that same at, at that same rate. So this just drives home that uh, a single event, even a large one, isn't necessarily going to solve the problem. Uh, you're going to need uh, several of them and you know, sort of like the one we had this morning, but have that spread out over uh, a much greater period of time, maybe lesser amounts each time to to keep that moisture up in the soil. Looking at some drought timelines, uh, shows the percentage of Wyoming in each category of drought from uh, 2000 to the present. Uh, currently, we're at about 106 weeks now with some part of the state in D3. Uh, we bottomed out at about 3.6, a little over 3.6% about two weeks ago as far as the, uh, the coverage of D3 in the state but it is starting to come up a bit now. Uh, these 
the area from uh, of D1 through D4 actual drought categories uh, actually decreased since the last webinar by a little under, I think it was 2% or so. Um, again, as I, as I like to point out, Wyoming's a big state, so uh, statewide view is only good for the, the 30,000 foot look. If you want to look at uh, individual county, we do have uh, the same type of maps uh, on a countywide basis at the at the Earl down here on the on the bottom of the page. So you might want to check that out for your specific area. And now just looking at a zoom in of the last uh, since 2000 uh, to, uh, 2020 to present, uh, the area of D3 or extreme drought uh, has increased. As I said, uh, we're up to about seven, looks like 7.11 percent of the state now at uh, uh, in D3 or the extreme drought. And on the other end of the scale, though, uh, almost 10 and a half percent of the state has no D category at all. Uh, that's an increase of a little over 3% since the last webinar, but it's down about 2.5% uh, from, from our, our peak of uh, non-drought area in the state, which was on the 5th of July, this little run here. So with that, uh, we'll see if Aaron Fiaschetti with the USGS has been able to connect to audio and uh, he'll take it over for surface water conditions. Tony, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much. This month here, we got a little bit of a mixed bag of conditions here. If you see along the, the northwest and northern portions of the state, flows look pretty good. And I'll just clarify here. Um, this map is showing dots of uh, real-time flows at our gauging station. So normal, the green is could be anywhere from the 25th to 75th percentile. So that's a pretty large range of flows. The central tendency would be the median there. And then we see kind of a smattering of the oranges that's less than the 25th, the 10th to the 24th percentile. So a pretty low flow. And then the dark reds are the much below normal that's less than the 10th percentile. So a very low flow. Um, so, and just one more quickly, where we should be about in the hydrograph generally, if your water's coming from the mountains, is we're receding off, a runoff is in the rear view mirror by a ways, and we're kind of receding into summer base flows, but generally there should be some water present. It's not as good as it was before, but we're receding into lower flows into August. So, just kind of back to the state here in the Northwest. Um, things look pretty good and generally flows are near the median or above the median. There's some pretty good flows over in the powder um, in Belfouche area right now. Um, it, one thing that kind of sticks out is uh, along the Wind River is that some of those gauges showing the water coming out of the mountains are a bit low right now. Um, so you kind of see that south south central and south uh, west corners are tend to be a little bit drier um, and you know this there's a lot of gauges here so it's a mix of you know those gauges where the water's coming out of the winds that's a pretty good indicator of what water supply conditions are right now kind of showing you that there's water starting to get low but you're seeing a mix too of reservoir management or calls for water where water's being maybe ushered down the stream or releases are being let out of the reservoir. So it's a bit of a mix of everything here when you look across the state and it's always worth a closer look. So if we could go to the next slide, Tony. So just kind of to show what's going on and generally in the Northwest corner, here's the North Fork Shoshone at Wapiti. And you see, we got a little bit of missing data here in the beginning of July, but in general, flows are looking pretty close to the median, looking pretty good. We're starting to recede into uh, lower flows in August, but you know, things look pretty good. We had a pretty good peak down there and it's looking all right, uh, much better than it was in April and May when things were pretty darn low over there and even into the beginning of June. So things are looking up in the, northwest corner right now. Moving over to the powder, um, 
things look pretty good over there right now. I mean, it's starting to drop off a bit and uh, things can get pretty low in the powder in August into September, but right now it's declining, but we're somewhere in that uh, normal range of flow and hopefully there'll be more rains to sustain that moving on forward. Moving on down here to the North Platte at the state line. Um, right now, things are looking pretty good. They must be moving water through the system. So flows are looking uh, pretty normal there. One thing to point out there in June is it either nearly went dry in that location according to our gauge. So things were, yeah, really low coming into the season and nearly bottomed out and then uh, risen up quite a bit. And I'm sure that's mostly in response to water management. And I'll sure we'll hear more about that uh, later on in the presentation. Going over to the green below Fontenelle, um, things were quite a, pretty low over there starting in the beginning of the season, but they've been bumping up um, and kind of being held there below the median. Um, but it's still in that normal range right now. So uh, things are, are looking okay there. And I'm sure that's a response to water being let out of the reservoir um, and move downstream. And then I believe we got one more, Tony. Oh yeah. And then uh, going on to reservoirs here, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a mixed bag here. Also, there's some increases in storage here uh, Buffalo Bill, uh, Fontenelle, and uh, Seminole, and then there is some 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 decreases in flow as what or in contents is what you'd expect that when uh, storage is drawn on um, over um, uh, Pathfinder and Keyhole and Palisades. Um, and, and one thing that kind of sticks out here is when you look at this map compared to last month or currently is that a lot of these reservoirs did not fill this year. Some got pretty close. I'm sure some did fill, but you still see a lot of white on that map in June. And that's when the water's moving around and when water probably should be storing and filling up reservoirs that's available. So I guess that's um, uh, paints a pretty good picture for what the, the runoff volumes were this year. So that's all I have. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, now, uh, Nikki Nielsen with the Bureau of Reclamation will talk a bit more about what, uh, reservoir operations. Nikki? Good morning. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit more about our current reservoir conditions within the Bighorn um, and North Platte Basins. Um, so once again, uh, our North Platte system is in the peach there on the Wyoming map. Um, our North Platte operations are going pretty much as expected at this time. We are in the heart of our irrigation deliveries and have been sending a boatload of water out of our reservoirs lately. Um, it's been hot and dry and we have delivered more water this year than any year since about 2012. So um, the forecasted April through July um, runoffs into the North Platte River Basin above Glendo were expected to be about 640,000 acre feet, um, which was about 72% of our 30 year average. We actually received about 630,000 acre feet, um, and that was as of this morning. So we were actually pretty uh, accurate as far as our inflows this year, um, just to have slightly below um, what we were expecting. But again, the irrigation deliveries have been high and we are drawing down our reservoirs as we speak. Um, the total conservation storage capacity in the North Platte uh, Reservoir System is about 2.8 million acre feet. And as of July 25th, um, our combined storage content in the North Platte was about 1.6 million acre feet. So we're right there at about half full, which is about 80% of our 30 year average. So in the, the teacup diagram um, to the right there, you can see that our big storage reservoirs, which are Seminole Pathfinder and Glendo, are all getting pretty low right now, which is pretty typical for this time of year, but um, we are hoping for wet winter to fill these guys up for next year. Um, 
we did just complete our silt run out of Guernsey. Um, so that's why you can see it's it's pretty low right now. But the silt run is basically where we reduce our flows out of Glendo while keeping our flows out of Guernsey um, the same. And it essentially draws down the, the Guernsey reservoir to a stream bed. And then the silt from the Guernsey <clears throat> reservoir is basically flushed downstream to our um, downstream farmers and this silt is just uh, good for the crops and does fill in some of the small holes in the canal. So we uh, do this silt run for 14 days and then we fill Guernsey back up for the rest of the irrigation um, season. So right now we are in the process of filling Guernsey and it should be back to normal operating levels within the next two days. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So here are the current operations for the North Platte system. Uh, current releases are 530 CFS um, from the Seminole Reservoir through the Miracle Mile, and that is just our winter operating flows. Um, and we are uh, down that load just to facilitate some work that we will be performing on the power plant in the next couple weeks. Uh, releases out of Gray Reef right now are about 3,000 CFS and are expected to be reduced next week to about 2,600. Releases out of Glendo are currently at 7,500 CFS. And again, that's just um, to fill up Guernsey from the silt run. Um, we will be reducing those flows as soon as uh, we do get Guernsey filled up. And then releases out of Guernsey Reservoir are variable and they're just based upon irrigation um, downstream requirements, but are currently at 5,050. Um, typically for this time of year, we peak at about 4,600. So we are uh, delivering a lot of water. Uh, next slide. So onto the Bighorn Basin shown in the blue on the Wyoming map. Um, we did start the season out not expecting to fill Buffalo Bill Reservoir, um, but we did have some uh, above average inflows in May and June, which resulted in more inflows than um, anticipated. So with a below average reservoir elevation at the start of the season, we were able to capture all that um, abundant runoff and uh, were able to fill. So the June runoff into Buffalo Bill was 134% uh, of average. The maximum daily average inflow in June was 15,586 CFS and that occurred on June 13th. So we got a lot of water in for a little bit there. Um, our maximum outflows for Buffalo Bill was 5,000 CFS. Our maximum inflows into Boysen was 13,500 CFS and our maximum outflows were 4,770 CFS. Next slide. So here are the current operations for the Bighorn Basin. Um, for the remainder of the irrigation season releases from all three reservoirs will be based on downstream irrigation demands. On Tuesday, July 26, downstream irrigators did pay for a flushing flow from Boysen. Um, the flows went from 1,250 CFS to 3,200 CFS and were maintained there for 12 hours before gradually uh, returning to the 1,250 CFS. So for the most up-to-date information on our water releases um, out of any of our reservoirs, you can um, go to that website shown there below in red. And as soon as we send out our water orders um, to our operators, I will also get uploaded to that site so you can see them almost instantaneously. And next slide. So again, here is just our HydroMet uh, data system on our website. Uh, and that is available to the public. Uh, this site does have gauging stations, not just in Wyoming, but in all of the states that are uh, managed by reclamation. And most of these gauging stations can get you up to date information, usually in about 15 minute intervals. You can also uh, get on there and get historical information and print off charts showing information over months or even years. So on the right photo, I just made a graph of the releases from Glendo between May and June. Um, some of the other parameters uh, that you can look up include reservoir storage, evaporation rates, uh, four, bay, four bay elevations, and daily inflows. So um, it's a pretty neat tool available to the public. And that's all I have for uh, the Wyoming Area Office July updates. Thanks, Nikki. Mm -hmm.
And now Jeff Cowley with the SEO or State Engineer's Office will discuss uh, water rights administrations. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Tony. Hello, everybody. Uh, here is uh, a map showing um, the four quadrants of Wyoming divvied up into the district or divisions of the state and the corresponding superintendents with their contact info. So if you have extra questions after today, you can give them a call on, on specific calls for regulation. <clears throat> Next slide, Tony. Um, one thing you'll notice this uh, month is that each division has two pages worth of calls because as you can tell, things are hot and dry out there. So I'm not gonna read each one of these, but um, as we sit here, you can see we still have the call on the North Platte for uh, irrigation pumpers, um, Bear Creek, Horseshoe Creek, uh, Laramie River, um, and Tribs are, as you're noticing here, these are all 1800 dates. Um, so things are pretty, pretty dry out there. Next slide, Tony. Um, again, you'll see more calls on the Laramie. We even have uh, in this number five up here, uh, priority of number 17 of the Laramie River Court Decree. So we're, we're getting into the 1883s um, and the next one down 1875. So we're, we're way, way back in the priority system on, on these creeks at this time in the North Platte. Um, Laramie River, sorry, Rattlesnake and, and uh, Bates Creek there. Thanks, Tony. Next one. Um, here in the Division Two is pretty bad too. We have Big Goose Creek, Little Goose, Lower Clear, Piney Creek, Upper Clear, Lower Clear, um, and those are different stretches of Lower Clear Creek and different priority dates. If you're looking at those closely. Next slide, Tony. <clears throat> this one's a little different now. We got an update from Dave Schroeder, and and they're moving or distributing reservoir water um, that that people have finally called for. So uh, they're as uh, uh, the NRCS guy and Aaron was saying a minute ago, we're, we're starting to move reservoir water even in some of the smaller reservoirs as well. On uh, the bottom one here, um, the uh, irrigation district in um, just inside South Dakota has called for their water out of Keyhole. So we're moving that water down and regulating Wyoming to its 10% um, allocation for the natural flows that are still in the Belfouche River there. So uh, next slide, Tony. Division three has a lot of calls on here and um, Owl Creek, Grass Creek, Gooseberry, Gravel River. Um, some of these aren't clear back to the 1800s, but pretty darn close. Uh, next slide, Tony. And Cottonwood Creek and Medicine Lodge Creek and Paint Rock Creek are all still on calls there in, in division three. So now on to division four. We've got a lot in here now too. Um, North Piney, Central Bear, um, Fish Creek, Blacks Fork, South Piney, Burnt Fork are all uh, calls that are going on currently. And there's a couple more on the next page. We've got some newer ones here starting in, in later June, Middle Piney, Birch Creek, and sorry, I missed the top one, Smith's Fork Creek. Uh, and then the last slide, Tony, I think is a, another uh, shot for you guys to get a phone number for those superintendents. Um, <clears throat> I, I was reminded just a few minutes before this call, I, I've received a few calls through. And if you go to our website, I, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, didn't get it in the presentation today, but if you go to the state engineer's website on the left-hand side, if you click on the home page or the home button and down the, towards the bottom of that, there's news and press releases. Um, back in May, the state engineer signed the emergency stock use memo and the policy for fighting wildfires. Uh, if anybody has any questions towards the end, they can ask about those, or you can go to our website, like I said, and scroll down to those May 6th memos that uh, seem to be coming out earlier and earlier each year now that it's, we've got the uh, dry hydrology. Thank you, Tony. All right, thanks, Jeff. I will switch gears over to forecasts and outlooks, and I'll turn it over to Jared Allen with the National Weather Service over in Cheyenne, and he'll talk to us about those forecasts and outlooks. Great. Thanks, Tony. This is Jared Allen, Warning Coordination Meteorologist here at the National Weather Service in Cheyenne, actually coming to you live from our operations floor. Uh, we're actually monitoring some pretty good heavy thunderstorms over the Mullen Burn Scar right now. So if you hear some commotion in the background, that's what we're all talking about here. You can probably see a little bit on my screens back over here uh, with the Mullen Burn Scar and some heavy rainfall. So it's, it's actually quite possible we might be doing a flash flood warning for that here coming up soon. 
Uh, talking to this slide here, though, this is uh, what we're anticipating uh, where Tony, you actually were just highlighting down there in the south and southeast where a uh, pretty good plume of monsoonal moisture is settled into the west and the south portions of the state. Uh, and then combined with a little bit of some instability in the atmosphere is really helping fire off a lot of these uh, moderate to heavy rain showers and thunderstorms, especially over the higher terrain. Uh, for the, the southern and eastern portions of the state, uh, sorry, the western portions of the state. Uh, unfortunately, for the next seven days, uh, they're in the central components of the state and northeast. We're not looking at too much rainfall, unfortunately, uh, at this time. So drought conditions potentially could worsen a little bit in those aspects. But on the flip side, hopefully we can pick up some good rainfall, hopefully not any flooding rainfall, uh, say across the higher terrain in northwest part of the state, the Wind River Range, maybe some portions of Park County, or the Absorcas, and then for southwest portions of the state. Uh, so a little bit cooler today with some of this rainfall uh, as well. And then we're going to actually going to have a pretty good warming trend going into the weekend and then especially next week for central and eastern portions of the state. Uh, again, wanted to highlight the localized higher rainfall amounts, certainly a greater than an inch possible, uh, could be um, lo localized across, say, the southeast portions and southern portions of the state. Uh, where some localized flash flooding could be uh, possible, especially in more vulnerable spots, uh, such as burn scars for the state. And uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, looking forward ahead for the six to 10 day temperature outlook there on the left, uh, across a good portion of the state of Wyoming, especially central and east, we're gonna be favored extremely to highly above normal temperatures. There's gonna be a good ridge of high pressure uh, heat dome, kind of so to speak, that sets up over the Midwest and we'll kind of feel its uh, influences uh, from that direction. Uh, the slight good news too though, is that monsoon moisture is gonna stick around a little bit as well, looking at the six to 10 day precipitation outlook from the National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center, uh, where we're gonna be favored uh, to be above normal for precipitation uh, for most of the state, maybe except the far east, but the farther west you are in the state or southwest you are, uh, that monsoonal moisture should help contribute to at least some like scattered of, thunderstorms uh, across portions of the state. And then if we go forward one more, looking at the eight to 14 day, uh, again, that strong signal uh, for the Midwest of above normal temperatures uh, will start, will continue to impact Eastern, especially Central and Eastern portions of the state uh, for the temperatures. So above normal temperatures favored, especially Eastern Wyoming. And we still retain a little bit of that monsoonal yes, signal. Yes, uh, it shifts a little bit further to the southwest, say towards the four corners. The but the, the southwest part of the state does look to have a bit more of a favored signal for at least non-dry or slightly above normal precipitation. Uh, the farther uh, northeast you go, uh, that signal kind of decreases, especially the super far northeast Wyoming, uh, where you might actually be slightly below normal. And uh, next slide. And then taking a look at the longer big picture, so August, September, October, what are we looking for for the remaining uh, summer months and maybe even early fall months? Unfortunately, looking at generally above normal conditions there on the left uh, for that time frame, especially for central and southwest being more favored to be above normal and then being hopefully slightly cooler further to the northeast. And then on the pre seasonal precipitation outlook, uh, looking at general below normal rainfall through that three month period. Now, can we have some additional rain showers that bring some localized flooding impacts during that time? Yes, certainly possible, but the overall general average across those three months will generally be below average. Uh, here in Cheyenne, we're still about four inches to, to five inches below normal, and that's a good in indicative indicator across a couple different portions of the state too. And then if we go additionally one more, this is a uh, long range hazard outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, really highlighting that excessive heat that looks to build between August 4th and August 10th, especially Midwest where they have the, the highest signal. And then as you go further to the uh, West, you, you have that moderate signal and then Central and Eastern Wyoming is in that slight risk of excessive heat during that August 4th to August 10th timeframe. Uh, so we're gonna have some pockets of heavy rain, especially over the next couple of days lowering over the weekend into Monday. Uh, and then we're gonna be looking to turn up the heat a little bit next week, but also retaining some moisture uh, from the desert Southwest too. So a little hot, but we'll also have some rain showers around too to hopefully punctuate that drought. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jared.
Now we'll go to Joel Peters, who is with us from the Bureau of Land Management to discuss fuel status and the, uh, the wildland fire outlook. Joel? All right, thank you, Tony. Um, so what we'll start covering is some of our standard indices that we use of our energy release component. Um, so basically for the folks that are newer to this, it's kind of just that uh, relates to the BTUs, the amount of heat that that fire can put out at the flame in front of the head of a fire. So it's just the essentially the amount of heat that that fire can put out. Um, so as we progress into the summer, without any kind of, you know, reprieve moisture that we've seen, those continue to generally climb. And then as we get moisture, they will kind of drop back down. So it accounts for moisture. Um, and then uh, if we're getting a lack of moisture, those uh, indices will also climb uh, from there. Always uh, expressed as a percentile, as most of the information we've seen here. Another indice we often evaluate is that thousand hour fuel moisture, which is our large diameter fuels um, in that three to eight inch class. Um, they're a really good indicator of drought over fairly large areas. We do some you know, fuel sampling throughout the state, so we know kind of where those, um, where those fuels are at and their moisture levels. So once again, any precip that we get is really going to help us out um, you know, in, in getting some moisture back in those fuels and, and not having them continue to dry out throughout the summer. Uh, next slide. Uh, here we'll look at some of the energy release components. Um, for some of the raw stations located throughout the state. Uh, this map changes quite a bit over time, um, just due to localized rain events um, that can really hit some of these locations. So one of the, the biggest things shown in here is kind of that Northwest and Western Wyoming. Um, we're really kind of showing that the higher levels of percentiles in our ERCs right now. We've had some recent um, precip, I know along the Wind River front, um, sharp nose raws is the bright red one there, right out. Yep, right there, perfect circle on it. Um, yesterday afternoon, we had a great cell that followed the, the Wind River front there and uh, dumped some significant moisture. So hopefully that will, uh, that one will actually go down here uh, in the coming days um, as well. And uh, over the last, you know, month or two, a lot of that northern Colorado and moving into the south uh, eastern area of the state was much higher um, in their indices for the ERC. Those have kind of kind of dropped a bit. Uh, there's one purple anomaly one in there that could be some localized stuff or possible data errors there. But overall, throughout the state, we're seeing definitely some reprieve. Um, you know, shots of moisture in certain locations um, that are really helping that out. Um, and we'll show some graphs here in a little bit that really represent uh, those moisture events. So one of the biggest things that can help moderate those indices as we go throughout the summer um, as things progress. Uh, next slide. So here's one we'll pull out of the Laramie Mountains, um, that being fairly valid just due to the Sugarloaf fire that's currently going on there. Um, you can really see the spike that they had, um, you know, probably around the 20th or so of, of July, really hit some high numbers there. It's hard to tell on this graph, but probably record numbers there. It's kind of covering some of the red, but if they weren't record, they were um, definitely very close and then got a good drop in there um, with some of those moisture events and changing weather. Um, sometimes just a, a good passage of a weather system, even if it doesn't dump a lot of rain, but we get cooler conditions for a longer period of time and higher humidities it can really help these ERCs and, and drop them down. Um, so I think some of this plays into the success they're having on that fire out there with uh, some moderated fire behavior and, and uh, continue to drop those, those indices out there to get the upper hand. Uh, next slide. Here we got one from the Shoshone. Um, you know, this one for quite some time was at or under um, average and they really, you know, the, some of that hot, dry, windy weather here going in around the same time of that 20th um, of July really cranked their stuff up um, into a high level, well above average, not in, into record stuff, but after the moisture they received, it's definitely significant, um, but also a nice drop there, getting them back down towards the average values and hopefully uh, with some of this weather this week that'll continue. But uh, as mentioned, we definitely got some hotter, drier weather in the forecast coming up. And those uh, indices will, will, I'm sure, will reflect that soon and, and make their climb back up. Uh, next slide. 
I uh, just threw this one in here with the Black Hills, uh, kind of on the edge of Wyoming there. So they've definitely had some real big bouncing around there as well. They were up in the, you know, record values in the red there, um, you know, a little bit earlier maybe than the 20th, uh, 18th or so, and then a very significant drop um, down to below average, and then slowly or quickly increasing back up into the average realm. So they definitely are seeing some reprieve over there as well. Um, once again, the, you know, you get a stretch of three to five days of hot, dry weather, and those indices will really show that and will continue to spike back up. Uh, next slide. So we'll just touch on some, some of the outlooks uh, the national outlooks that come out of the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise. Um, looking at kind of their stuff for August, you know, showing some of the, the stuff in Northwest Wyoming being a little bit above average potential there with uh, most of the state hopefully just being in that average um, realm uh, as we move forward. And then looking into September, not a lot of changes there. It's, it's a very similar graph for Wyoming Montana and our neighbors to the east, um, Nebraska and Kansas. So most of the changes there are actually out in the, the, the Midwest on this map. So we'll see where that goes, um, see what the weather does and hopefully uh, we get into more of that average realm and they get some precip in that Northwest, or excuse me, Northeast portion of the state to help moderate that. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Joel. And that brings it back to me with a quick recap of the uh, U.S. Drought Monitor. Uh, again, we saw some improvements and degradations around the state from, from precip or a lack of it, depending on, on where you look, uh, with the outlooks leaning toward below normal precip statewide and leaning toward above normal temperature in the northeastern two-thirds of the state and likely above normal for the southwestern third. Uh, expect drought conditions to persist or intensify in those areas. Um, before we get into how you can help, I did want to uh, quickly highlight the farmers.gov site, which lists some uh, relief and disaster assistance programs to help uh, aid with recovery process. Um, the Earl is shown here on the slide, and I'd encourage you to, to check that out when you, when you have the time. Now, the two ways that you can uh, help record uh, conditions in your area, uh, the more input we get from around the state on the, you know, the impacts that you're feeling and conditions that you're seeing, the more accurate, precise that uh, drop monitor can be made. And the first of those is through the Condition Monitoring Observer Reports, or CMOR. Um, the Earl is highlighted on the slide here, and here you can submit a report detailing what you're seeing in terms of impacts in your area. And uh, several different categories, crops, livestock, surface water, freshwater, household, uh, hydropower. And this batch down here in the southeast is a new set of uh, reports that have come in since our last webinar. And it's uh, confirmation of just uh, the deterioration of the conditions down there. Uh, you can also include photographs. However, with a single photograph showing current conditions is nice. The problem with just one photo is there's no real temporal context. So it's kind of hard to tell from, you know, just from one photo how or out of the ordinary those conditions are. Uh, it's very helpful if you can include a photo from a, uh, from a similar vantage point that's showing what is normal or even just from near the same date in uh, prior years to get a comparison year by year. Uh, doing so makes that photo of current conditions so much more useful and so much more, uh, like I say, in, in context of what's going on. And just a standard caveat that the photos you upload are publicly viewable, so keep that in mind as well. The other way you can help is to become a COCORAS observer. You can send in condition reports through this program as well, uh, but uh, the original thrust of that network was to get a better handle on on the variation of precipitation over short distances and to, to fill in the gaps that are uh, that exist in uh, existing programs. Uh, observers set up a, a four inch diameter rain gauge like you see here, and you can submit your precipitation uh, online each morning. Uh, the form that you can enter that in is here. Uh, if you sign up, please note that uh, zero is just as valid a number as any other. It's uh, it's very invaluable also to know where the precip has not fallen to. 
Uh, the map here on the left has the observations reported so far this morning. You can see the, the event, uh, events actually that came through yesterday afternoon, evening, and then uh, early this morning. Um, the map on the, the right here shows the observers who've been active in the last year or two. And as you can see, not everybody reports every day. So the more observers we have, the better chance that a particular area is going to be representative on a, on a given day. And this map here kind of shows all the stations that are used to create precipitation grids uh, on a given date. Uh, this one is specifically for June 1st. Uh, the number of stations on a particular day will be different uh, depending on which day it is, uh, depending on which stations uh, submit observations, which pass uh, QAQC checks and, and that sort. But as you can see, there's uh, Coco Ross, National Weather Service Co-op, NRCS Snow Tell, Hydromet, uh, Climate Reference Network stations on there. But even with all those networks combined, we still need help filling in the gaps. And you can do that by becoming a Coco Ross observer. Uh, and if you're not in a gap area, that's no problem. Uh, when we have multiple stations in an area, so outside of these big areas as well, um, it's no problem because multiple stations can serve as sort of a, a quality control check amongst themselves. And, and also if you or one of your neighbors decides to take a well-earned vacation, data still come in from that area. So if you're interested in taking part, you can sign up at the URL down here in the, in the lower left, or you can contact me via the information here. And that will conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of our presenters whose names and affiliations are listed on the slide here. And on behalf of them, we thank you for joining us today. So now let's see if we have any questions.